Hi, my name is Karim Benamar, and today is Friday, April 17th, 2020. Now, the coronavirus is spreading around the world. Half of humanity is under some form of lockdown. Thousands of people are dying every day, and most of us are worried about what this means for our future, for our livelihood, for the economy, for our loved ones. And so in this short talk, I would like to take some inspiration from the book, The Plague, written in 1947 by the French philosopher Albert Camus, which tells us not only how to live in a situation of a pandemic, but also how we can react to it, how we can show our humanity, how we can do our jobs as human beings. Stay safe, be compassionate, take care of others, and thank you for listening. Rebellion Against Corona. What can we learn from the novel The Plague by Albert Camus? Now, I don't want to give you any spoilers for this wonderful book uh, because I would like you to read it yourself, but I want to use some of the events and some of the quotes from the book uh, to tell us what we can learn in this time of a global pandemic. And I want to link some of the elements in the book to the key elements in Camus' philosophy, namely the idea of the absurd hero and the concept of rebellion. And I want to end with the sense of what is the plague in times of corona? What can we learn from what the people in the book have to go through? Now, the book is set in Oran, which is a city in northern Algeria on the sea. Uh, my father is Algerian, I'm half Algerian, in the 1940s. And it starts off that um, the key um, protagonist, Dr. Bernard Rieux, sees a rat falling ill in his uh, apartment block and dying. And soon all the rats come out, hundreds a day, and people are quite surprised by this, uh, but eventually they realize something really quite dreadful is going on. Now, the other protagonists are all men. Uh, there is a journalist, a civil servant, uh, somebody who's involved in shady business. Uh, there is the priest who gives sermons and the judge, uh, Othon. But, but with all the rats dying, people realize there's something quite strange happening. And um, they realize there's a disease, um, that it's spreading, uh, people start dying. And the first thing is people really don't want to give up their habits. Um, they're in, in denial. Uh, the, the, the city makes a lot of, does a lot of business, people have plans, um, there, there is, life is organized in a certain way. And in the first instance, these deaths are seen as just a bit of an annoyance uh, in the sense that, you know, life must go on. And this is very much, I think, how we reacted to the global cor uh, coronavirus pandemic initially when all these, uh, this terrible news came out of China and, and Europe and America thought it would never reach their shores. So, so that reaction of denial, that reaction of thinking that it will pass us by, um, is quite a universal reaction because it was described uh, 80 years ago in a book already. Um, and, and even calling it the plague is a big issue. They, they seem to call it a syndrome or a disease or they, they don't want to use that word the plague because then, then they realize how tough it will be. But Camus says, you know, no one will ever be free so long as there's pestilences. We can't just decide what we want to do with our lives as long as there's these diseases which um, determine to a certain extent what human life is. Now, who is Albert Camus? Albert Camus is uh, uh, born in Mondovi in Algeria, 1913. Uh, he grew up in great poverty. His father died in the First World War in battle. His mother was an uh, illiterate cleaner, but he did very well at school and his teachers encouraged him to write, to, uh, to do well. Uh, he got scholarships. Um, he was also plagued by ill health. Uh, when he was 17, he had a very strong bout of tuberculosis and his doctor came to his bedside and said, you are old enough, you are strong enough to be told you will die. Normally, I don't like to think that biographical elements really determine a philosopher's thinking, but it really contributed to his sense of the absurd, which we'll get to. Camus moved on to Algiers, then to Paris. He, was, he wrote as a journalist. He started writing literature. He started writing theater play. And this was uh, in the years leading up to the Second World War. Then he did two cycles of writing important books. Uh, the first one is uh, The Stranger, which became a worldwide phenomenon, L'Etranger, followed by The Myth of Sisyphus. And, and these are kind of companion books. One examines what it means to be an individual, 
um, in, a, in a novel form and the other in a philosophical form. Uh, the second um, group was the plague in 1947 and the rebel. And, and there again, it examined how do we live with others? Now, Camus got a lot of criticism for the book The Rebel because of his pacifist stance. And he fell out with his fellow uh, existentialist philosopher Jean-Paul Sartre. Uh, people criticized him and he had a, he had a few tough years. Uh, he wrote a short novella, The Fall, which is actually quite depressing in terms of, of human, the human condition. But then things started looking up when he won the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1957. It allowed him to buy a house in the south of France, the first time that he, he wasn't actually poor. Um, you see him in the garden with his twin children here. And, and things were looking up. And he was working on, on a new book, a new cycle uh, about love, um, when he died in a car accident at the beginning of 1960. Um, also a rather absurd situation because he was carrying a train ticket for the journey, but his editor had convinced him that, you know, why don't we go for a road trip? The, the book that he was working on, which was in his, uh, in his bag in the car, was called The First Man, and it was published in 1995. So let's go back to the plague. The first thing that happened once the plague was established, the city was cut off, nobody was allowed to go out or in, uh, goods were not really allowed to travel, letters weren't allowed to travel, people could only send telegrams. The first thing the plague brought was exile, and it was exile in one's own home. You were far away from the people that you loved, you were far away from contact from the outside world. And in antiquity, exile was sometimes seen as a punishment worse than death, because you kept on living, but you couldn't live with the people that you cared about, and you couldn't go about your usual business. Uh, Dr. Rieu con continues to treat the patients. He can't do very much because there's no medicine, there's no vaccine at that moment and he just has to quarantine the other people in the house when there's been a case of the plague, and the people who have the plague go and die actually quite painful deaths in, in hospital or makeshift hospitals. There is no intensive care, there is no, not, not the kind of uh, technological wonders uh, that we have now. And, and in a discussion with some of the other people in the novel, um, he says, you know, these victories will never be lasting, um, but that doesn't mean that there is a reason for giving up the struggle. Uh, basically, life and, and his struggle of the Dr. Rieu is, is a never-ending defeat. He will always lose out to the plague, uh, but he continues to do his job. Uh, and this is a key element that we will see um, further on about what the absurd hero does. And Camus says that the plague was also the great equalizer. It revealed itself as what it really was. That is, the concern of all. But after a few months of this quarantine, people realized the plague didn't make any distinction between the rich and the poor and the healthy and the sick, and everybody was involved, everybody was engaged in the same exile. People react very differently. The journalist wants to leave, he's, he's trying to escape by all means possible. Other people are, are spending money and eating and drinking and dressing up. Other people are depressed. Some people are responding by focusing on a project they've had for a long time. Uh, one of the protagonists is writing a novel but wants to have the perfect first sentence. And Camus has a lot of fun with, with that as a kind of recurring joke. And perhaps we could ask ourselves, what different kind of reactions are we seeing? Um, you know, is it, is, it, is it help and solidarity? Is it depression? Is it party like there's no tomorrow? Is it trying to escape by flying to some far off island? Now, the plague is also an allegory, which is a literary device, uh, which is, allows a character, a place, or an event to deliver a broader message about real-world issues. And the plague was written at the end of the Second World War, and it was also really an allegory for the resistance, for the occupation on the Nazism uh, that Camus had lived through. Um, so it wasn't just about the literal plague, it was also about the other plagues, about the human conditions under a situation of exile, a situation of siege. And we know that Camus did this on purpose because he starts the book by a quote from Daniel Defoe, who'd written a book called The Journal of the Plague Years. It is as reasonable to represent one kind of imprisonment by another as it is to represent anything that really exists by that which exists not. So the plague tells us not just about an epidemic, it can tell us about a war situation, and it tells us about life itself. Because really, Dr. Bernard Rieu is the absurd hero. 
And Camus illustrates the absurd hero in his philosophical book, The Myths of Sisyphus. Now, Sisyphus uh, was a Greek punished by the gods for his disobedience because he chose life over death. He tried to rescue his wife from the underworld or he brought water to the city or whatever. And the gods had decided to punish him by doing the most ridiculous job ever. He had to kind of push this large boulder uphill and then the boulder would roll back down and, the, and this would have to go on for all eternity. And the very meanness of this, this terrible punishment was that it made no sense. You know, if Sisyphus had to build a pyramid, at least he would have had a pyramid after a while. But this, there was no result to his work. And, and Camus analyzes this character of Sisyphus and calls him the absurd hero. He is absurd because he has this passion to push this rock up the hill, and this is his torment. He's tormented by the fact that it has no result. And really what Sisyphus does is he gives meaning to a useless occupation. Camus says he still has his rock. It is his work that he's doing. And he concludes one must imagine Sisyphus happy, which is really quite paradoxical. But of course, we can recognize Dr. Rieu in Sisyphus. Dr. Rieu has to treat all these plague patients, but there is no result. Uh, they all die. Of course, you can also make some jokes about Sisyphus having to work at home now in these lockdown situations with his rock. But the the, the, the point of the absurd hero is the, 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 the very concept of absurdity. Now, absurdity for, for Camus means something very specific. Humans desire meaning. They want life to make sense. They want the universe to make sense. But the universe doesn't make sense. It's completely irrational. And that is really the hardest thing for humans to accept. It's the heart-wrenching realization of an incomprehensible world and a useless fate. Life is meaningless. It doesn't matter. The border will roll down again. The people will die from plague and disease and war. And there's nothing you can do about it. So how do we react to it? Camus gives us three possibilities. The first is suicide. If these are the rules of the game, of life, I don't want to participate. But Camus shows very quickly that that doesn't change the absurdity of life. It just means you're not participating anymore. The second is hope. And that sounds positive. But it's really a dream, a sleep, according to Camus. Hope is the feeling that I might not understand the meaning of life now, I might not understand the point of my torment, but I will someday. Something out there, there is a structure, there is a meaning, I just haven't found it yet. And the hope in salvation, the hope in God, Camus is an atheist, is this kind of hope, that somebody's going to take care of us, that it isn't just meaningless. And Camus thinks it's a very dangerous um, feeling to have. What he proposes instead is this rebellion, la révolte in French. And this is a paradoxical solution to a paradoxical situation. The absurd is paradoxical because you want there to be meaning and there isn't meaning. And the reaction of rebellion is to accept that it's meaningless. Okay, there is no point. But at the same time to rebel against it. At the same time, you're going to say, it is meaningless, but I will still live, I will still love, I will still have passion, I will still do all these things. Rebellion, freedom, and passion, according to Camus, are the way to deal with the absurd. The life is absurd, you can't change it, but what you can change is your own reaction, your own attitude, your own engagement with life. And so, experiencing the present moment consciously with everything that it entails, is the ideal of the absurd hero. Let's return to the plague. At that point, the plague has been going on for months, summer has come, and it's going into a situation of lockdown. People have to stay inside, uh, the bars and restaurants are closing, and you get the isolation, uh, the loneliness of people who are by themselves. What we're seeing in our kind of shelter-in-place situations. Martial law is declared. And, and people build hospitals everywhere. And, and so it's become much, much grimmer because the plague isn't letting up and still killing people all the time. And Camus says that what really is the length of the lockdown, they're into it for, for eight months, is starting to really wear on people. It, it's people have become numb because of the length of the time. This is something we're not into yet, yet, but may happen to us. There's a slow, deliberate progress of some monstrous thing crushing out all upon its path. Camus says, we're only condemned men hoping for the most capricious of pardons. 
He, li he likens the situation under the plague to prisoners who, who may be pardoned, but we don't know when. People can handle problems, people can handle setbacks, but they need to know when this is all going to end. And finally, after 10 months, when people are completely worn down, the plague leaves as inexplicably as when it came. And the city is reopened and people rejoice and people can't quite believe that their ordeal is over. And Dr. Rieu goes and visits some of his old patients and one of them says, what does it mean, the plague? It's just life, no more than that. And that is really part of the key structure of his allegory. The plague is not just an allegory for the Nazi occupation or a war situation or exile or something terrible that's happened to us, a quarantine. It is also an allegory for life itself. All the things that happen in the plague situation happen in our lives. Some people die, some people don't. Some people fall ill, some people live to a ripe old age, some people are cut down in their youth. It is capricious, there is no meaning to it. And so the reactions we have to a plague situations are in fact the reactions we should have to life. It's not heroism. Rio is an absurd hero and that's slightly different. He says, heroism and sanctity don't really appeal to me, I imagine. What interests me is being a man. And it's that sense of what it means to be a human being, which we can see in the idea of rebellion. In The Rebel, Camus looks at the death of others as a philosophical question. And he sees a sense of solidarity. I rebel, therefore we as a group exist. Because we all rebel against fate, against the capriciousness of fate, against the meaninglessness of existence, we have become a community. And a community that's striving to show what it means to be human, what life on earth can be. This is something we do through our actions, through our beliefs, through what we say, through how we live. And Camus is very specific because he doesn't want to have some great utopian ideal. He lived at a time when there were large ideologies such as communism and people would sacrifice their lives for them. And Camus is very much against that. I'm against dying for ideals instead of killing and dying in order to produce the being that we are not. We have to live and let live in order to create what we are. So let's not die and sacrifice ourselves for some utopian future that may or may not happen. Let's actually live our daily lives in the way that we want life to exist. We cannot be unjust today to achieve justice tomorrow. And, and this was at the core of his disagreement with Sartre. Sartre thought that you could die and you could kill if you wanted to create a just society. He thought that if you didn't see that, you were being naive. But Camus said, no, why should we do that? Even in the Algerian War of Independence, which was raging at that time, Camus was saying, but I'm thinking of my mother who is in a tram in Algiers and she might be bombed. And he was trying to find a solution through dialogue and not through this kind of all-out destructive war. And people thought of him as a, as, a, as a naive pacifist and as a dangerous pacifist. But I think we've certainly come round to Camus' way of thinking about this. What is the point of destroying life for some kind of possible future? How then are we going to live? Well, like Dr. Rieu, like the absurd hero of the plague, with measure, a measured life, with love, with passion. Uh, Dr. Rio keeps treating the patients even though he knows it's quite useless. Rebellion itself gives life its value and its meaning because when we experience life, we experience the rebellion, we experience a freedom that we have to choose, we are living as intensely as possible. And through our living, we are showing what humans can be. So what does the plague tell us about our own times in the corona pandemic? Well, first, it's amazing how recognizable the experience in the book is. A plague is a universal human experience. Uh, we've had pandemics before, but it's just the sense of what it means to be alive is the same as in a situation of pandemic, because there are different reactions to life. People trying to escape it, people trying to um, drink and, and eat and pretend it's not happening, people who are getting depressed, uh, people who are thriving on the hardship conditions. We all go through different stages 
of, of sadness about the corona pandemic, about engagement to do something about it, about dreams for a better world, although we, we'd have to be careful in the Camus sense that we're not fighting and dying and sacrificing for this ideal of tomorrow. Instead, the plague proposes the idea of compassion, compassion with the frailty of human beings, with the sense of how hard it is to live if life is meaningless, if we're under a constant plague and pandemic condition, and to show that solidarity. I rebel, therefore we are. We are all in this together. We are all rebelling against this capricious fate, against this virus that tries to kill us, or against this other situation. And it is not a divine punishment. Um, the priest Panelou gives two speeches in, in the book where he tries to make sense of the plague through God. And of course, Camus writes it in such a way that he's not, being, he's not very successful. And in our situation of Corona, many people are saying this is nature reacting to us. This is a punishment we deserve because we've been bad. We've been, we, and I think we have been bad against nature, but I don't think it's a punishment from nature. The virus is not a punishment, either from some God or from nature itself. Nature doesn't punish. That's not how nature works. We are anthropomorphizing it. We are trying to make it human. But we decide what humanity is. And Rieu concludes, really, the thing was to do your job as it should be done. And by that, he meant not just his job as a doctor, but his job as a human being was to not give up, to keep doing it, even though it was a series of endless defeats, and to stand there and to declare against the fate, against the capriciousness of the virus, against the danger that he was in, this is what I do and this is what I stand for. And Camus concludes the book with the following quote. To state quite simply what we learn in a time of pestilence, that there are more things to admire in men than to despise. And so the question that the book asks of us, that the current situation asks of us, is how can we do our work as human beings? What does it mean against this fate, against the situation? Can we be the absurd hero who recognizes that the virus is capricious, that there is no rhyme or reason to it, that it's not a punishment from God or from nature, that we didn't deserve this or not deserve it for that matter, but how we react to it individually through the choices we make, communally in the way we organize and mobilize, and globally in the way we show compassion to those less fortunate than us. That is how we show our humanity. And so the rebellion against corona, against this capricious virus, is really all about showing what it means to be human. Thank you for listening. Be safe, be compassionate with your fellow human beings, and help wherever you can.